What do you think about ESOPs? I think right now, ESOP is one of the, this is something that we're playing around with right now. Banks are not emotional creatures. They're big, I, logical, uh, greedy, monstrous machines. And it's just the math doesn't work. I will give you one tip. Okay. Yeah. And this is kind of my secret weapon. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so I, I think it's one of the, whenever you look at how people have made like massive amounts of money, you look at the, the billionaires list, there's a lot of them that it's through acquisition one way or another. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Mac Duckworth and he is the CEO and founder of Rhapsody, a financial services firm that helps early to mid career CEOs plan and execute roll-ups. So I'm very interested in this conversation. We've done some roll-ups in the past. We're working on one right now. I'm looking forward to learning from you today. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. We always start off with the origin story. You and I were hanging out and chatting for a while before we uh, hit the record button. But uh, So I know a little bit about it, but share with the audience who you are, where you're from, so they can kind of get a connection to you. Yeah, so I, I hail out of Little Rock, Arkansas. The way that I kind of got into this business, my first job out of college was I was a music composition major and uh, was staring at uh, having no job prospects and started to cold call investment banks because at the university that I was going to, an investment bank came and speak, came to speak and I, I caught the presentation. I thought it'd be really cool. So I, I reached out to them and through just happenstance, they had a one of the places that I talked to had a new guy training program because a lot of the folks working for him were, you know, 50 plus and about to retire. Um, so I, I kind of lucked into it. Um, I worked really hard and, uh, ended up going back to school, doing the whole MBA thing and came back and started doing fractional CFO services. And so the way that that sort of led to acquisitions is I was sort of this deal guy who had worked a little bit on wall street. And uh, in the firm that I was working at, I was kind of the only one who standing around who really knew what a deal looked like soup to nuts. And I had bought a business kind of in that that uh, span of time as well, a small business. And so um, we had clients that wanted to do acquisitions, and that's how I got into it. And the first one that we did, I, I went and bought a book on how to buy a small business <laughs> and uh, read a bunch of stuff online and figured out you know, soup to nuts, how to do it and went from, you know, help negotiate it, finance it, close it, integrate it, build the team, help to grow it. And so that was sort of my, my life as a CFO, helping other, other CEOs to grow through acquisition and kind of like how I, I ended up in rollups is we had a client that we helped buy a, a manufacturing business and he was trying to transition from his industry was changing. He was in a tangential market, so he needed to get into something else. We found a, a deal for him. We put the whole thing together, helped him helped him buy. It ended up being a really good deal. He grew it and uh, doubled revenue, triple cash flow. Great story. And I was kind of on board after the fact to try to figure out what do we do to take this thing to the next level. How do we keep growing? And our options because it's manufacturing, it's either we got to buy somebody or we've got to uh, build a new location. 
you know, we started to research, okay, like if we bought somebody, what does it look like? Who are the players? You know, we understood the market a little bit, but whenever you started to put the math to it and look at what does it do to our valuation and all that, um, it was pretty obvious there was, this was a market that was pretty niche. There was maybe, there was dozens of co competitors nationally in that market, but there was maybe like five that mattered. And we had good relationships with all, all most of those five and uh, started to acquire. And uh, we saw what that did to the valuation. And it was just, for me, it was a light bulb moment. I had been doing all the pieces of, of that roll-up puzzle, just helping companies to grow. But had it was like I had the ingredients to, to the recipe, but I didn't have the actual recipe. And whenever uh, I got kind of exposed to that, I realized this is this is the recipe. We need to really focus on the roll up. There's just not uh, if you're a good operator, a good CEO. There's not a lot of ways to to build value faster with less risk. You know, is, if you fit that mold. You know, a lot of people miss out on that. They don't. Mi they miss out on the fact that. There's a reason why private equity does this. There's a reason why people will go raise money for a fund from other people and then acquire multiple companies, glue them together, make them, integrate them together, make them work, and then eventually exit and sell. And yeah. it's because it's one of the fastest ways to grow a company. If, you, if, you, if a company tells me when I'm talking to them that they've grown 15 or 20% year over year and they plan on doing that for the next 10 years, I almost roll my eyes, right? Yeah. Because organic, unless they're acquiring companies, because organic growth is really hard to predict how long yep. you can continue doing something. I've yep. talked to countless business owners who thought that they're going to continue growing the way they've always grown because Google ads are killing it for them. And I was like, yeah, that works until everybody else figures it out. And then the price gets auctioned up and it doesn't work no more. And yeah, I think the magic formula is if you can get some level of organic growth. Mm -hmm. You kind of control your own destiny because then you can acquire, you know, that you kind of, you have a way to limit your downside. Mm -hmm. I think that there's like a cycle lot for a lot of CEOs who haven't acquired businesses before. There's a psychological barrier. There's like a fear of the unknown. They don't want to mess it up. They don't want to take a lot of risk, but they're the, it's the most de-risked kind of decision that they can make if they're, if they do know how to grow, you know, organically. Yeah, if they're a great operator, that's that's critical because that's the you can take a company that's mid level performance, stick a great operator in there and really tune it up. A lot of times these companies you're acquiring, they have great sales guy or they're they're great in some area, but it's not in all aspects. That's I don't right. know how many times I've looked at a company and go, you know what, they don't do any marketing. They got two really good sales guys. And they've got a great product and nobody ever leaves. So the reason they have the company they have is the customer retention is crazy. And they have two sales guys who have been there for 15 years landing one or two, three, four clients a year. Mm -hmm. And they keep them because their their product's good. Yep. What if they really did marketing? What if they doubled their sales guys? What if, you know, you know, we, yeah, we put some we've brochures out there? <laughs> yeah, we've seen this in IT, um, a group that, uh, we're connected to, it was four different business owners, mm -hmm. all in IT services. And, you know, one of them's great at marketing. One of them is great at just running the business, the operation side of it. One of them was really good at like uh, systemization and automation. And another one really actually knew how to run the sales force. Mm -hmm. And they had kind of talked about, hey, maybe we should do a roll up. Whenever they ended up putting together, they what you had at that point was now instead of like one business that has one superstar in just one position, now you got a superstar in every single seat on the org chart mm -hmm. and you can't, it's really difficult for your competition to kind of mess with that and disrupt that because there's just, you can't find that talent anywhere else right. you know, or, or they'd be running the business. You couldn't hire them. Right. That's another thing. A lot of people don't get is the best employees already have great jobs. Yeah, And right? if somebody's really good at what they do, they're already working somewhere. So how do you get, you know, 
you can go out there. Hiring great employees is difficult. It, it's always been difficult. It's, really it's difficult. been difficult in almost every industry. I told you before we hit the record button, we were, button, we were doing a marketing roll up. We talked to 200, 220, something like that, marketing agencies in a very short time frame. Uh, we had an extensive project going on where we were reaching out to them in every avenue we could, scheduling one hour calls. And you would think that marketing agencies would be really good at hiring people because they just had the market for the position being open. Yeah. But finding and retaining great talent was the number one problem almost all of them had. Yeah. Like if you asked what their biggest thing was. And that's, that goes across the board. So acquiring a company and doing roll-ups, you – how, it's like okay i get to go hire you know i'm a 50 person company i want something in my size or bigger and when i do this acquisition or close to it how do i go out and hire 30 great employees i buy a company that has 30 great 30 great employees yeah right and i retain the employees yeah there's there's a lot of different reasons to to do it the kind of the the math behind it is is pretty simple Right. You know, in, in if you're in this lower middle market, um, like manu- I'll just give you the example in manufacturing. Right now, about a million dollars EBITDA business might sell for a little under five times EBITDA. I'll just use like round numbers to keep this simple. Um, once that a business, let's say stable growth, same kind of profile, once that business reaches that $10 million EBITDA range, you have way more competition from private equity because all the capital in the market, it, it basically coagulates to the top. You know, it's the Black Rocks and the Black Stones, and then there's tiered down money managers who are basically mm-hmm. buying a business that then gets sold to a bigger business that then gets sold to a bigger business. So it's like the fit, little fish that gets eaten by the bigger fish that gets eaten by the and they all end up being fish. owned by BlackRock at some point. <laughs> yeah, and so and so the BlackRocks of the world, whenever there's a deal that fits that size criteria, because remember they can't they can't manage a thousand different companies in their portfolio. They got to like be really selective because it takes so much time to make sure that the investment goes well. So whenever a, an opportunity comes their way that fits their criteria is big enough in in that part of the world whenever you have very few opportunities so you must put that money to work or they're going to lose money from their their investors because they're they're not deploying capital right, right. and then they they're just sitting on cash charging a fee on it and you know investors that's the number one way to to lose assets under management is not deploy the capital so they have this huge incentive to go out and and buy more and so okay you've got the million dollar ebitda business that sells for 5x once it reaches that 10 million dollar ebitda number it's now at around it's it's 9 to 10x right mm-hmm. so without any operational improvement without nothing more than just you know combining companies and getting to the threshold and integrating them they have to be integrated then you're you have now created a ton of value. So like, let's use like an example where you deployed, uh, let's say that you bought just really simple math, 10 companies, each a million dollars in, in EBITDA, each at 5X EBITDA. So mm-hmm. with the math on that's like maybe $50 million right. in, in total capital deployed. You can borrow 80% of it, right? So that's, you need 10 million in equity. Mm-hmm. And then you, you execute the, the, you know, the integration, and at the end of that, you can get, let's say, call the numbers 10x because you've got some growth to, to show. And, you know, there's a story there. You've just taken $50 million in capital and turned it into $100 million in capital. And you've done it with $10 million in equity. Mm-hmm. And so you took the $10 million in equity and you turned it into 60. So the, the numbers get pretty compelling without having to, it's really about the integration, being able to find them. Uh, making sure that you keep key people on on board, those sort of things. Um, so I, I think it's one of the. Whenever you look at how people have made like massive amounts of money, you look at the the billionaires list. There's a lot of them that it's through acquisition, one way or another. You know, I, I have people who will come to me and uh, they'll say, "Hey, I've got this idea. They want me to fund it." Is what it usually is, but uh, they have got this idea for this product. And one of the things I try to convince people, you know, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have done this, but now knowing what I know now, 
is I try to convince them is find a company that that product would be an excellent additional line on their con- their existing business mm-hmm. and then acquire the company. Now you've got a company with revenue, a product market fit. You know that your product that you want to try or, or, or do would appeal to all the customers they already have and they're loyal to that company. Now you can introduce your product, you know, as a new item on that company. If it makes it, it makes it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And if it doesn't, you own a company and your bills are paid and you're you're, you're growing. And- I think it's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that we've talked to. We've, we're working with somebody now who's going down this path, but hasn't fully executed it. But we've had a lot of conversations with people about, okay, I've got this new technology mm-hmm. in, uh, one of the guys that we talked to a couple of years ago had developed a new type of security surveillance system that allowed you to use AI to like recognize people's faces and or if they had a gun, that kind of thing. And uh, it was going to cost, it was going to be a lot of money to bring it to market. And you'd still have to go through one of these security integrators. And so our thought was, hey, let's just buy an integrator Mm-hmm. We're, we have an instant customer. We have instant market feedback, right? Mm-hmm. And then we also, we buy at the right price. You're, you're self-funding some of the growth. And now you have, if you wanted to raise additional capital, you have revenue and a story to tell that yeah. makes it easier to, to get preferential treatment on the valuation. It's such a key difference. A lot of people just miss out on, I'm shocked that it's not taught more at the uh, educational level like at least when i did my mba i did i have a master's degree in marketing and i took some other classes outside of there mm-hmm. i don't remember ever being told like you know you should go buy a company everything you know, yeah. but i i was in silicon valley at the time so everything was about startup 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 yeah. right go raise capital oh, vc funding yeah you know that whole realm but nobody said you know what you know if you go out and do that you got to build it you got to find the right customer you got to do customer product market fit oh my gosh know. it's terribly There's, hard yeah you've got a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and you're not sure you got all the pieces right like yeah some you know somebody handed it's you the box good. it's been open you bought it at a garage sale and you're like i hope this thing works that's your typical startup right yeah and, you know and sometimes you're you're sitting there with a you know a pair of scissors and a file trying to make a piece of cardboard fit in the spot because you're missing a piece it's not it's not the same and i think I think it's starting to be now. There's a whole ETA programs in all kinds of schools. It was for a yeah. long time kind of reserved for the Ivies. Um, now I'm hearing all kinds of schools actually having uh, acquisition type of conversations and even ETA programs, entrepreneurship through acquisition programs in the schools. I know you were you were or are an adjunct professor. Uh, yep. I did that for a little while. Uh, I did that, you know, for a few few quarters i guess our schools and quarters um yeah there's definitely a there's an accounting for the risk reward between mm-hmm. like you know the, if you're an ambitious person you're thinking about should i build a startup should i buy a business you're, you're evaluating your options and the startup world is really tempting uh, especially if you can raise some vc money um, but the stats basically i think this is a lot of people know these numbers, but the stats prove out that it's just far more. I think the default rate on SBA loans for these sort of acquisitions in most markets is under two, three percent. So you can kind of take that as like a failure failure rate. And for startups, I think it's like less than one in ten make it more than five years. So yeah. and, and the chances of if you can buy a cash flowing business that's been around for 10 years, there's a system in place that that system has existed for 10 years. There's something about that system that allows it to continue to exist because it has passed that, that threshold. Right. Right. So there's uh, I think it's way less risky. And if you're really into like, I'm, I really love technology uh, and I have probably more ideas than I need, you know, and so I love the idea of like Brad Jacobs is an archetype for this. And I really like what he's done, like with United Rentals and, and other companies like this is he, he applies that same kind of entrepreneurial thinking to the rollout, mm-hmm. but he's doing it to create an advantage, a moat, 
Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between the, the whole startup culture and the, the doing a real roll up is with the startup culture, it's more about let's build the tech sometimes. And it's, uh, it's not necessarily about the boat, um, yeah. but where you want to get to is really have a big valuable business that has a moat. So I think the, you know, roll up with that kind of framework is, is probably the most compelling to me. If, if you're thinking about it from a financial perspective. So. Uh, it's brilliant to, to, to do a roll up and figure out how to fortify through a roll up strategy, your p position in the market. Right. Um, yeah. I, I think that that's, that's you know, secretly what Warren Buffett has done with a lot of the companies that, that he supported is, you know, the, whenever he talks with the CEO, I spent a ton of, I spent a ton of time in Omaha. Mm -hmm. And I'm a shareholder and I've been following Buffett for over a decade. And my, my dad got me into it whenever I was like in my teens. So um, I'll probably talk too much about Buffett. But one of the things that he's done, and I met some of his CEOs and people who he's worked with. He's buying a business that's not going to change a whole lot. He is acquire, doing bolt-on acquisitions that improve uh, the moat and uh, he's there. So they're constantly using acquisition to increase the moat. And what he's doing is he's reducing his cost of capital as they get bigger. And then he's also increasing the return on investing capital so that the margin on each dollar of capital that he deploys is bigger mm -hmm. as it grows. And that, that's what creates the compounding machine. And so I'm getting into some esoteric finance stuff here. I'm a finance guy by training. So I don't want to go too deep in it, but um, I th I think it's the most elegant solution. I'm I'm kind of in love with it. So I often help other people do roll ups, not quite from the financial point you do, mostly from the lead generation, start the conversation, build rapport with the owner, uh, get them close to an L. You know, look at the financials, but I hand those over to somebody way more talented than me to look at them, look at the numbers. And then we structure something and get it to LOI type yeah. of thing. One of the things that I run into a lot of times when I'm talking to somebody who owns a decent business and they're like, you know, I'd like to, to acquire a business, but I don't think I have the money to do it. How do, how do mm -hmm. I fund this? What are yeah. your, I, I know you have a simple illustrated guide. I was looking through it. Uh, it explains how to fund these roll-ups, how to fund an acquisition. Yeah. Uh, share with us. If you're a CEO out there, you're listening to the show and you would like to acquire another company, they don't have to have $10 million sitting in the bank to go on a buying spree, right? right. What right. are the methods that you would you would help them as a CFO structure to make these deals work? Yeah, in, in most of these deals, there's gonna be some level of debt financing from a bank, just as a baseline that we can kind of assume. And then typically the deal will have, you know, a little bit of seller financing, not not always in, in, the, in the form of a note. A seller mm -hmm. note. And then what the beauty of a roll up too is that there is a true story to tell about, hey, Mr. Business Owner, you're going to roll over 20% of your equity. And I'm going to make that little 20% worth two or three or four or five times more than what you can get for it now if you sold me 100% of the business. And so roll in with me, contribute your expertise. Maybe you sit on the board, maybe your expert uh, advisor or whatever that looks like. And by doing, by structuring the deal that way, mm -hmm. you'd be surprised how little cash you can come to the table with. I, I've, I've done this with, with multiple deals and we've closed deals approaching $10 million deals with less than, you know, less than a, a million, like 500,000 on a $9 million deal mm -hmm. and getting the money back within six months through cash flow. So there's ways to do it like that. And then the question is if you're talented CEO, but maybe you've got your equity locked up or maybe you don't have the cash to bring to the table. Um, there, the truth about where we're at from a market perspective is there's a lot of cash, not a lot of talent. A lot of retiring business owners too. So if you're a young operator and, you, and there's a plan of how we're going to make this thing more valuable, that's realistic that you can kind of prove out, then there is a whole host of 
family offices, uh, private equity to an extent, but getting started, you wouldn't even have to go that far. far. There's uh, a large network of people who want to invest $50,000, $100,000, $250,000 into these sort of roll-up opportunities and small business acquisitions. And so it's tapping into that network and, and uh, with a good opportunity, the, the money's there. There, there are fewer... There's a lot more money than, than good deals. I'll put it that way. Yeah, and a lot of people are, I mean, many of those investors, they're looking for great operators. They're looking for a horse to back, right? I, I hate to put it that way, but they're, they're looking for somebody who they can believe in. They know they're going to get their money back because it's secure. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an up and running business. You're not asking them to throw money in a startup, an idea that doesn't have a proven market. You're mm -hmm. saying, here's an existing business that's up, running, producing income, doing well. It's not mine to figure out. It's mine to screw up. And I haven't screwed up yeah. the one I'm running already. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. That's a different story for investors. It's like, it's a, it's way safer. Yeah, it's not going to have the unicorn returns potentially that a startup, you know, the one in 100 startups, you have to invest in 100 startups to get the one that's going to make yep. up for all 99 of the ones that failed. But uh, you don't have to go through 100 of them to, to get one done. It's going to be a fairly secure transaction. And you can structure those investor deals. This is sort of the, the point of some of the information that we've distributed is mm -hmm. with on roll-up equity is you can structure. A lot of times investors get what's called a, a preference return. And so there's different ways to structure that, but basically, mm -hmm. you know, they're first capital in and then they're kind of first capital out right. you know, after the bank gets its money back. What that allows them to do is reduce their risk and return though, you as the CEO, if you're in that roll up leader position can kind of capture upside above that, you know? So if you're a great sales leader uh, and know how to, uh, you know, an industry, know how to grow a business. Um, there's ways to capture a lot, a lot of that upside. So we've talked a lot about if you're an existing CEO, you own a business and growing through a roll up. What if somebody out there who is an operator, uh, they've got the experience there, you know, maybe they've had experience as a CEO in the past. They got a little money to invest and they want to go out and kick off a roll up. Are they just as able as the existing business owner? to get these bank back transactions where 80% of it's uh, a financial institution loan on the money, or is that primarily kind of the world of you already have an existing business they can see? Let's say that somebody was a, you use marketing firm. Somebody has been the COO or VP of operations at a marketing firm. Um, and they've got a deal that they want to do in my experience. And I don't know how every bank in the world is going to think about this, but, having true in industry experience and then being able to say, Hey, here is the business plan. I've done, I did this over here. Here's my experience. I'm going to apply the same playbook over here. I just, the only major difference is I'm, I'm running the show and I, my, my name is on the note. You know, the typical there's, there's, you know, in terms of financing, there's different, uh, from maybe up to $5 million transactions, six, maybe, you can even bump it to seven if you got creative. I would we would call that an SBA deal, yeah. In, in which is really special. And I think that that's kind of where most people end up starting. And uh, those make a lot of sense from a CEO or, or a buyer's perspective, and if somebody's going to invest in it too. Once you get above that, the financing options kind of change. Mm -hmm. And uh, this space sort of between seven, eight, nine, and in, in 20 million, there's actually not a lot of people who play in that space from a lending perspective and, and investor perspective. And so what ends up happening there is uh, a lot of creativity, seller financing, uh, probably more equity. You're having to bring to the table from friends, family, these people, this network of folks who uh, are willing to write the $100,000, $250,000 check into a, a small business. And so it's a little bit more work is my point. Uh, the rewards can be good because there's, you still have very, very attractive uh, valuations in that range typically. 
it's not quite where a lot of private equity is playing, but you're much closer to that that hurdle where the, you get the bump in multiple when it, because so much competition comes in from from private equity. I was hoping you were to say something different. <laughs> the reason yeah. is is I I've interviewed quite a few people and I. I, I was hoping you knew of a lot of people playing in that realm. There's a dead zone right now in that five, seven million. You can do five million was from the SBA. Then you can do these what they call mezzanine loans and add on loans and get close to seven. But from that seven million to probably as, as big in a lot of uh, industries, as big as 50 million, nobody's really playing in that zone. I've been trying to get somebody from like one of the leaders from SBA to come on the podcast because I want to like have the conversation with somebody about what if you know right now you're doing the 75 or something like that percent guarantee on up to 5 million, which banks are yeah. interested in. What if we just like, what can't, why can't we look at things like, we'll just do a 60% on the eight, nine and 10. Right. Yeah. And then go 40 or 50 percent on 10 to 15. If they would do that, banks would step forward. If, they, if you could just yeah. reduce some of that risk. Right. The reason the only reason banks aren't in that space from, say, eight, seven million, eight million to 50 million is the risk to reward ratio is not right for them. They have almost insurance level actuaries that know the math, know the risk, you know, know everything about this, you know, that know how to, they run all these models. They have very complex computer algorithms and spreadsheets that look at it and go, the risk reward isn't worth it, or they'd be there, right? That's just, a, yeah. it's a, banks are not emotional creatures. They're big, uh, logical, greedy, uh, monstrous machines. And it's just, the math doesn't work. I will give you one tip. Okay. Yeah. And this is kind of my secret weapon. So, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, there is a there is an instrument called the industrial revenue bond. I have a very good relationship with an investment bank. That I finance one deal using this. I've I've got one other that I'm looking at right now using this instrument. It's it's niche. The deal has to check a few boxes. Like it's got to be uh, the right valuation it's got to have probably have real estate with it there's a certain amount of assets that you need for this to fit but what mm -hmm. this allows you to do is to issue tax-free and taxable municipal bonds through like a, a county conduit or something but basically mm -hmm. to finance the acquisition and so basically you can go you're going through wall street to be able to issue debt the beauty of it is, so this is one of the deals that we did uh, was a 30 year amortization. There's a manufacturing business that owns some real estate and had big equipment, but um, it was a 30 year amortization. Uh, we financed a hundred percent of the deal and then some for equipment ex uh, expansion. The first year, no payments on interest. The interest was accrued in years two and three, we paid interest only. And so it allowed us to build up a cash hoard, but this was, a, you can do these sorts of deals in that, uh, up to about $20 million range. There's, it, it, there is a section of the, the IRC code that carves out what you can finance with this. So it's like niche, but if you're, there are carve outs too, where you can go above that, like, like waste management and a few others. What so was the name of it again? It's, a, it's called an industrial revenue bond. Industrial revenue bond. Oh, okay. I forgot to mention that when we did this deal, all those great terms, it was non-recourse. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. We'll have to double check on that one. And are there, is it, is it, because it, it says it's industrial, is it industry specific? Is there certain things you just can't buy with this or? It would be typically what's going to fit is a manufacturing operation or any, any business that's, it's got cash flow. It in it, you have to have a certain amount of asset base mm -hmm. to be able to do the at least the tax free portion, and you have to have a certain amount of that, I think. So, but yeah, it's it's a really powerful piece of it, and you can combine it. This is the other thing too: is you can combine it with SBA. You can you can do some mixing and matching because whenever you're going through Wall Street, you're you're dealing with with a much more it's a different way of thinking about credit risk than a bank. And so they're much more flexible. Is this something you just like reach out to the proper SEC attorney and say, 
hey, we want to structure this uh, industrial revenue bond. And uh, is there like, I'm trying to think what's the, what's the process? There are very few. Yeah. There are very few people who do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I can tell you uh, DA Davidson is one of the investment banks that, that does these. Um, I know there are a handful of other investment banks that, that do it. If anybody's interested, they can, I, I can connect them with folks. Um, okay. It's intriguing. I always look for new er- new areas to do the to do things that we're trying to get done. So uh, that's that's one I hadn't heard of before. Yeah. Let's talk about the different structures. I know when we created, I think the longest thing that we it took us to do in that marketing roll up we were working on was to get the structure right. We spent quite a mo- bit of money with the attorneys going back and forth, going, "What if we did X, Y, and Z?" And they're like, "No, no, no you can do X, but Y and Z are going to mess you up." Okay, what if yeah. we do X, A, B, and C? And they're like, well, you can do you know X and A, but B and C are going to mess you up. So we went back and forth, and we created a waterfall of, uh, type of thing where mm-hmm. uh, what we did is we the reason we landed, I told you before, we had like 26 LOIs within a short period of time is because we gave the business owners like, look, what do you believe your current valuation is? And as long as we could agree upon that, we locked that in, and we only participated in the uplift. So, you know, you come in, you maintain your valuation, we take a percentage, you know, uh, you know, a minority stake even in the uplift, you know, so they get to keep the full evaluation of where they were at and a majority of the uplift. But we participate in in a a fairly significant minority of the, uh, I don't know that I can disclose. I, I think if you can, yeah, you, I get what you're saying. I, yeah. I, I think if you could pull that off, that's a really interesting way to do it. It's it's to to get everybody teed up all at once and facilitate that. I know people have talked about that. It's it's hard to do, and you couldn't. You know, there's been I've seen people debate on like, could you just flip it to to private equity? And the guys that I've talked to at private equity have basically said, now nah, we need to integrate it and you know have it. Re- but, we were told 18 months of integration. They want to see it working together for 18 months. So our goal was to get them all underneath the same roof, start the integration process, you know, spend 18 months to two years ironing that out and making it look, you know, congelled and working well together. Uh, and we were already talking to, I mean, we didn't build this. We didn't build that without talking to private equity. We went out and said, what do yeah. you want us to build? Right. I and, think that's smart. Yeah. And we went out and we also, we said, what do you want us to build? We, we also, at that stage, it went out to, we had two people on our board that had done it before, had created, you know, 500 plus million dollar marketing exits. One of them was in the okay. Marketing Hall of Fame. And that's the reason when it, when it dissolved, it was because two of the executives decided they wanted to do it on their own. And they convinced the two guys on our board that everybody wanted to work with. The whole reason we had so many LOIs is we had two rock stars, like had done this before on our board and being advisors to them, they took those guys with them. So it was like, what are we going to do? We're going to tell these 26 people, no, stay with us, but you don't get to work with these two heroes you've looked up to your whole career. Right. So that said, our model was, Hey, you get to work with these two. These guys have done this before. They're your advisors. Mm -hmm. We're going to do your, we're your M and a team. We're going to go find the other companies. Mm -hmm. That was our role. And by the way, you get to keep hundred percent of your current valuation and a majority of what we create together. I think that's compelling. Yeah. I've I've not thought about it like that because what I I kind of get, I like to get control, mm-hmm. and that term some people can say that you know it's a turn off sort of word, but uh, deal control. You're in real estate, you kind of know yeah. like deal yeah. controls a, a lot of the a lot of the game, and then and build a foundation, mm-hmm. and make sure that the first few pieces are working, yeah. and then kind of grow from there. Uh, cause I have, I've honestly, this is my confession. I've gone into some businesses right off the bat and changed mm-hmm. a bunch of things and it just didn't work. It, yeah. Typically it's like cultural stuff, you know, this people didn't fit. And so I've learned to be a little bit more patient about like trying to pull everything together all at once. And, uh, just, that's my style. Yeah. I don't know if there's a good or bad to it, but, um, so that said, you know, that, we didn't get far enough down there to see how expensive it was going to be if we had to roll somebody back or let them back loose because that was going to be a little bit spendy because if you think about it, when you bring somebody underneath the umbrella, 
you're doing asset agreements, you're doing all this stuff. And then when you cut them back loose, you've already probably integrated some of their stuff. So now you got to figure out how to unintegrate their payroll, unintegrate yeah, their. That's... You know. <laughs> oh my gosh. I yeah. can't imagine. Well, yeah. But well, it's, uh, we, it's, it was I, one of those, we, we would cross that bridge when we get there kind of thing. So uh, we never got there. It sounds really creative though on the legal side. And yeah. that's, uh, that's a lot of the hard work a yeah. lot of times is you're, you're trying to, that was kind of a custom built solution for, you know, uh, and, and the, well, the reason, is, and the other thing is, is it depends on the industry. Marketing agencies actually have a huge problem in the fact that they can only get so big before they hit this artificial ceiling. So yep. uh, in the marketing agency world, the big boys don't want to play with the little guys. So if you're a PepsiCo or a, I keep using soda names, uh, but if you're some big brand, you don't want some mom and pop guy doing your marketing because they don't have enough staff to move quickly enough. So yeah. problem if you're in marketing agency, you go out and you build this great agency, you're training employees from right out of college to being great. They're, they start getting good enough. They're ready for a big company, right? They're ready to do a campaign for a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or a General Electric, whatever, a big company. You just don't warrant the ability to, to land one of those contracts. So what do you what do you do? You end up becoming a grooming ground for agents or a marketing uh, employees, and they leave. They go work for the bigger agencies. Interesting. So you're constantly yeah. trying to you know stop yeah. that. So you know marketing agencies from zero to five million is you know, in revenue or EBITDA is pretty straightforward for them. But at some point, they just get to where it's just hard to move forward any faster because in order to go yeah. bigger, they need you know, they need to be able to land bigger clients and they're told they're not even big enough to bid. bid. Like they don't even get in yeah. the uh, request for uh, for bids. They don't even get a, a seat at the table to, to make a pitch. Yeah. So we were solving that by, look, look, you'll be, you're part of this international marketing group. That's who you're going to go in and pitch at. And we'll send, you know, you tell us who you need on your team. We'll pull that from one of the other agencies. You guys go pitch it together and you carve up the work. You do what you do. They do what they do. And uh, we figure this out. Yeah. And I imagine a lot of these agencies, they have leaders who are really good at the creative side of it, you mm -hmm. know, it, but not so great operationally. And yeah. it's like, just, I would love to be able to offload this stuff to somebody else. Yeah. It's not as easy anyway. So, you know, yeah. they were really disrupted and looking for opportunities. So that, I think that played into it too. You know, it's just one of those industries that is leans up to, that. Another industry is kind of like that is the, I see a lot of people doing roll-ups in the financial spaces of bookkeeping and accounting firms. It's kind of a little bit of the same thing. The big boys want big accounting firms to deal with their stuff. They don't want to have a mom and pop accounting shop. Right? Yeah. They want a brand they to want slap brand. on the audit. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, these, these guys, they have, they have an artificial ceiling to how fast they can grow and how big they can grow. Um, because they can't land the big guys. They can't land the billion dollar entities because they just, they don't have the brand for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what was running through my mind, yeah. you know, cause we, we had a, an accounting firm for a while that we spun off, but, mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, the fight for talent was real. Once people get to a certain level, they feel like I need to, get, if you don't have a way to kind of stair step them up into something bigger and better make them feel like, you know, I'm creating all this value. Let me share in it. And a lot of them are like practitioners or, or sort of like not artists, but like, like craftsmen in a way, the really good ones. And so it's like, they need another, another hill to climb, another mountain to, to top. Uh, so it's really difficult. So yeah, it's interesting how that works. It's the same it, way in the market agency, right? You get somebody who's a creative and he's, done the logo for his local golf pro shop and he's done the logo for you know the local restaurant you know but he wants something to hang a tile on his name right he wants to yeah. redesign a logo or create a logo for some name brand that you know will write a ticket for him on his resume and you're not going to get that as you know i don't care if you got the best logo designer in the world coca-cola decides to, uh, to land a new flavor they're going to go have three different agencies that have 500 employees bid against each other and maybe even do a little competition to yep. see who wins the design and the, the rollout. Right. Yep. So 
it's a tough it's a tough gig and a lot of industries have this so that you know that that leans to the roll up strategy too if you can find an industry that has some form of barrier that that they can't break through unless they're bigger you know the mm-hmm. you're not big enough to play one of them would be the accounting like you know you, you you're not big enough to play you know, be the accountant for Lockheed Martin, <laughs> it, you know, <laughs> picking a name that's not a Coca-Cola here. You're not, you're not going to be the accountant for Lockheed Martin if you have 13 employees at your local Tulsa, you know, CPA firm, right? Yeah. You know, they're just not going to do yeah. it. There's a play inside of that that says, it's make you bigger. Yeah, I think that there's something yeah. there. I, I've always thought that if there was somebody who could basically build a company to, in that accounting finance space, to and do mm-hmm. a roll up, but make it such that the game plan was to basically like give everybody a piece of the equity who's like a key employee mm. and then create some kind of liquidity event. Like, I don't know, IPO, I, I don't, I hadn't thought to pass that point because there's a lot of different ways to go, but that speaks to my heart because that's kind of how I started Rhapsody is I felt like I, there wasn't, wasn't a whole lot of places that I could go at my current employer uh, that was very interesting. You know, we were kind of tapped out. So I had to start something myself to be able to scratch that itch. What do you think about ESOPs? I think right now, ESOP is one of the, this is something that we're playing around with right now. I, th- I yeah. think that there's a, one of, one of the pitches that we've made re- recently to uh, a, a business owner who is, he was very was a manufacturing firm, very concerned about his employees and, and treating them well. And making sure that we weren't going to mm-hmm. like move operations to China or something like that. One of the things that we have started to model out is, you know, we buy the business and structure it as a as a roll up. But there would be over a certain period of time an ESOP for about fifty one percent of the business to bring those employees in. So, uh, and then we would we would be able to take money out, reinvest it into other stuff, but. Now we've got committed folks and we get the valuation bump from the ESOP. Right now there's a little bit of Delta there. So Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's expensive to do if it's a small deal, but um, I I think it's interesting. So I've had a a play that I keep kicking around that that if I do another one where I'm the the leader of or, you know, a key player in and not a minority stake, like I do a lot of things where I'm the minority stakeholder Mm -hmm. and I'm just helping out. Because then I, you know, I put in a few hours, you know, here and there for them and get them what they need and got a lot more leeway with my yeah. time. When I'm ready to kick off something where I'm going to pull a lot of hours to get it done, I think there's a play out there to do it's a roll up strategy, but you're committing to the business owners that within a certain period of time that you'll sell, you know, sell it to an ESOP. Yeah. And I think there's, it needs to be a decent sized company. And I think a lot of business owners are out there that would love to see their employees own it, but they have the realization that they don't have the time or skill and the employees don't have the knowledge to run the company. They don't have the time or skill to train the employees to be great operators. And the employees- It's a black. big problem once, yeah. Once an ESOP, once you have a, a business owned 100% by the ESOP, you have all of these weird agency problems where it's like they don't have any, I, one of the guys who's an advisor for us is, He's been in manufacturing for like his whole career yep. as an engineer and has worked for a bunch of ESOP companies. And like one, one of the CEOs who he worked for, this is maybe $300 million business, 100% ESOP. The CEO owned shares in the ESOP, but he didn't want to change a whole lot because it was like, all I got to do is ride this thing out and I can, I can sell back into the ESOP and I'm, I'm good. If I do anything to mess it up though, then it impacts my retirement and he didn't want to mess it up. Yeah. And so I think that there's this play for, you know, you sell 51% or something to the ESOP, but then you have dedicated real management who's going to lead the business and you you need true visionary leadership, I think. So the goal that I was looking to do is I've interviewed so many people. One of the, the teams I've interviewed, they've acquired 60 plus businesses. They teach people how to, be great operators and great employee operators. They, they've got, there's a book, it's semi uh, popular. I mean, it's, it was a big a long time ago and now they've got some new versions of it. It's called the great game of business. Have you read that? 
Yeah. So the yep. guys that wrote the great grab of business, I've interviewed them and uh, they've acquired 60 plus companies, mostly in the manufacturing yeah. space. And they actually have a training program that teaches people how to be great operators. So my play, I'll just throw it out there because I'm a bleak below, bleak believer in the blue ocean strategy my play was to go to business owners say look uh if you're what would love to see your employees run in this company i'll commit we'll come in we'll raise a little capital we'll buy buy that business out set you up for retirement we'll bring in the right training and their training is not that expensive i think you can train a group of four or five executives for under six figures or right at six figures um, okay. Like, you know, like a hundred grand will train the, the top four or five execs. We'll train the employees to be great operators. We'll sit with them and, you know, for the next four, three, four, five years, whatever it takes until they show that they're great operators. And then we'll guarantee that we'll sell some majority stake, maybe 50, 60% of that over. But we'll also reserve a board seat and some control over the company to be advisors to them over time. So we'll, mm-hmm. our parent company, our holding company will have boards, you know, and advisors to make sure that it's taken care of and we'll maintain some type of minority stake in there with uh you can have a minority stake and a say you know with you know we have two you know yeah so we just make sure that we maintain enough seats on the board and you know our minority stake at 40 percent is probably the biggest stakeholder that the company will have so we'll have you know still maintain control right because the rest of the 60% is just, they, the, all the employees to put together could outvote you, which is very possible. And if so, it probably needed to be done, right? You get, if you get outvoted in that scenario, you're probably doing something you shouldn't. And that's, that's, that would be the play. And I think there's room for it out there. I honestly think that there's a lot of, I think that you're, I think that you're onto something, something that just seems really has always seemed strange to me. You know, we have a, like a educational system that's, it, you have a very clear path and you read books and stuff and you do these assignments in a class, but it's not like learning by doing, mm-hmm. right? But like if you you got into a career, if you went to work for a manufacturing plant in Germany, you'd be an apprentice. And, and, and there's a craftsmanship. I think that entrepreneurship is the same way. Mm-hmm. I think that anybody can probably be an entrepreneur if you just give them enough time because it's a skill set like playing the guitar. Oh, yeah. Right? Absolutely. It, or like, you know, you, we were talking earlier before we hit record about martial arts, you know, it's a, it's a, you got to work at it. And I think what makes a huge impact, it's made a huge impact for me is getting to work around people who are, you know, a level up from, from where I'm at so that they can show me here's, here's a different way to think about it, or here's how to, how you handle that situation. And so if I were a business owner, I'd be curious what listeners think about this idea because I, I think that there's something to it. If I was a business owner and I really cared about my employees and I, I wanted this thing to continue on into the future and like I've got my my little DNA stamp on it, I would want some kind of mechanism for those people to be mentored, mm-hmm. right? But that's not going to happen unless there is a structure in place to make it happen right right? it has to be planned on you know and built into the system or just how how would you rely on it happen so there's something there i think that's compelling yeah you just you just commit to them say look we'll we'll take control of it now we're going to bring this we're going to bring a company in they're going to train all the employees how to understand balance sheets income statements how their individual daily daily role impacts everything and we're going to give them some decision making power we're going to Put some of that employee uh, stock ownership benefits in it, meaning there's going to be bonus structures and stuff based on performance. That's one of the things that Game of Business does is it gamifies everything. So there's going to be a financial incentive from the the day after we get uh, get them trained on this. And then over time, when it shows that they're ready, and we'll, you have, I think we'd have to commit to a certain time. Within X number of years, we'll make the transition. We'll actually spend the money have the ESOP come in and we'll sell X percentage of the company to that ESOP. And yeah, uh, the- I think that this is this whole giving the, I'm really passionate about this. I've been, this is, you brought up something that I've been working on this yeah. in, in the background of how do you give the blue collar worker a piece of America again? Mm-hmm. I think this is a really important and powerful message is because 
I don't know if you've seen the chart since we got off. Nixon took took us off of that gold standard benchmark in like 1971. And since that time, the, the disparity between the rich and the poor, the chart looks like this, mm -hmm. you know? And so in like the cost of education has gone up. You, you got, you know, all the stats. It's a real problem. If you look back at history, it's a, every time that that, that dispersion has gotten too wide, there's been some kind of major breakdown or revolution or change in government. Um, and I think that the whole system has been set up to make the rich richer and keep everybody else kind of where they're at. And I'm not, I'm a, I'm a capitalist, <laughs> but uh, I think that you ought to bring people along with you. And so, and I think that it's probably smart business too, you know, to give them a piece of the pie. There's a third component inside of this, I think, business owners care about. And a lot of these business owners know that their business is a cornerstone to the little community they set it up in. A lot of these yeah. businesses are in rural, you know, rural America, and they're yeah. the major employer for 30 or 40 miles. And yeah. they don't want to sell to somebody that's going to do a roll up and then, you know, move the entire thing to Dallas because, you know, it's just a bigger city. And that's where one of the bigger companies is. That's By right. guaranteeing it's an ESOP, you give the employees the say, at least. What happens when we acquire this other company? They're going to, you know, are, are we going to operate separately or are you guys going to move? Or, you know, who wants to move? Who needs yep. to move? So you're not only protecting the employees, the legacy, your brand and name that you created and put your heart and soul into, I guess that's legacy, but you're also, you know, adding some component of uh, protection for the community because. Yeah, you, and it's you, really important. Yeah, you're, you're guaranteeing to that, you know, for the uh, owner, we're going to give your employees a say what happens with the future of this company once we hand it to an ESOP. And you'll have to have some type of provisions in there that you won't sell it or do anything else to it before they have their say. Yeah, I think the you know, the challenge of we've we got a few clients that are in the the very rural areas that we've worked with. And the challenge is getting all that human capital and knowledge mm -hmm. to the town. It's hard to recruit there. And so a lot of that, like you, you said earlier, is like bringing in training. I think if you could bring in world-class training and mentoring to these rural areas, there's a lot of government money to support rural development. There's mm -hmm. the, the, that industrial revenue bond program that I told you about mm -hmm. supports that as well, because you've got to, you've got to make the commitment to that location mm -hmm. and that's a long-term commitment, you know? So there's, uh, I think the combination of those things that you're talking about is what maybe there's some magic there. Well, we're running out of time. So maybe we should carry this conversation on at another time. Maybe you know, I can figure something out to, to solve this problem for uh, yeah. rural American businesses. Before we go though, before okay. we call it a show, let's make sure everybody knows how to reach out to you and work with you. So what's the best way to contact you? Best way to contact me is uh, through either LinkedIn mm -hmm. and they can just Google my name and they'll see uh, Matthew Duckworth and I'm the, the roll up guy on LinkedIn. Or um, if somebody wants to reach out directly, they can, uh, I'll give give out my email address and it's um, Matt, M-A-T-T at Rhapsody.net and Rhapsody is R-H-A-P-S-O-D-I. So I instead of a Y. And uh, you actually have a little PDF that you gave me to share with that. I'll put that in the show notes too, but it shows the uh, what a roll-up strategy looks like uh, illustrated. So it has the different structures and preferred stock versus um, you know different things, how it's funded. Uh, yeah. It's a great uh, PDF guide to get, you know, a primer to get somebody kind of thinking about this. So I'll put yeah, that in the Yeah, very simple illustrated guide. Yep. Yeah. I'll make sure that's in the show notes too. Well, let's call that a show. Let's wrap this up and hang out for a few minutes and we'll chat. Great. Thank you. I don't want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and to decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, 
Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business, you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the itexchangenet.com slash marketplace, how to exit. That link will be in the show notes. Visit them now.